The books were manufactured sometime in the fourth Christian century. There are solid reasons for thinking that these Coptic books are translations of Greek originals that were written sometime in the second century or possibly even earlier. The Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Philip, the Gospel of Truth, many Gospels, many writings attributed to Jesus and his disciples that we simply had never seen before. But it changes the whole picture. We get a much fuller, much more complicated, dense picture of the early Christian movement, stories we hadn't heard, arguments we didn't know about, all kinds of disputes that are part of the formation of this movement. There are secret revelations that are found here. There's mystical poetry here. Uh, there are descriptions of how the universe came into existence. These long lost documents appear to expand on the words and teachings of Jesus found in the Bible. What you find in the Gospels of the New Testament is what Jesus preached to thousands of people out on the hills of Galilee. But what you find in these secret Gospels are what Jesus said in private. Mystical teachings, advanced level teachings that you wouldn't just throw out to a crowd. Since their discovery, many Christians have dismissed the authenticity of these books. If I was a scholar in ancient history, all ancient texts are of interest. If you're asking me as a Christian, as a pastor, about their value, I don't see much value. For scholars, they are a treasure trove because they show us what other Christians were saying outside of the circles of the Orthodox. They're competing claims about Jesus, competing stories, competing versions, or you might say just different perspectives. No perspective has been more challenging to modern Christians than that found in the ancient text attributed to the Apostle Thomas. The Gospel of Thomas is called the Gospel is unlike any of the other Gospels. These are the teachings that Jesus said after the resurrection. These are the secret teachings of Jesus from the missing 40 days. The Gospel of Thomas is 114 sayings of Jesus. These uh, sayings uh, reflect some of the sayings that you find in other sources. Uh, about half of the sayings you can find in the New Testament Gospels. There are other sayings, though, that are completely different from what you find in the New Testament. And scholars debate, what is the nature of these sayings? What kind of teachings do they represent? Could they be the way Jesus actually said these sayings? Could they be the more original form of those sayings? And these sayings that are not found in the New Testament, is it possible that Jesus really said these things? Is this an additional source for us for understanding Jesus' teachings? Thomas then is a person who is the recipient of revelation. He's a person who asks Jesus questions and he's a person to whom Jesus reveals himself, perhaps in a more intimate way because perhaps from the very start, they have a more intimate relationship. Far from being a doubter, Thomas may have been a close confidant of the resurrected Jesus, and that may have made his teachings doubly problematic for the earliest Christians. The Gospel of Thomas is one of those books that, that the uh, Orthodox Church Fathers found problematic. This Gospel doesn't emphasize the importance of Jesus' death and resurrection for salvation. This gospel did not toe the line theologically, and for that reason, church fathers condemned it. The opening lines of that gospel have intrigued scholars for half a century. These are the secret words of the living Jesus, and Judas Didymus Thomas wrote them down. Whoever understands the secret meaning of these words will not taste death. This gospel doesn't emphasize the importance of Jesus' death and resurrection for salvation. This gospel doesn't emphasize the importance of Jesus' death and resurrection for salvation. Thomas, Thomas means the twin. And there's a meaning inside this gospel that this gospel is a way of becoming the twin of Jesus. That he's in fact saying, understand this stuff and you're me. When you read the Gospel of Thomas, there Jesus says the kingdom of God is not something coming at the end of time. It's something inside you, outside of you. It's something everywhere. It's, it's living in the presence of God. The presence of God. You have a spark of the divine within you. 
You have to know yourself to come into the kingdom. You are the sons of the living Father. If you don't know yourself, you, you aren't going to have salvation. There were a lot of Gospels that didn't make it into the New Testament, and many of these uh, have been permanently lost, and so we don't know exactly what they, what they were. But were these Gospels really lost? Or were there other, more sinister motives for leaving them out of the New Testament? The answer begins with the writing of the first stories about a resurrected Jesus Christ. Many believe that the authors of the Gospels were apostles who had themselves witnessed the events of the 40 days. Others challenge that claim. These Gospels are written 30, 40, 50 years after the events that they describe by people who were not there to see these things happen. In other words, after Jesus died, people started telling stories about him, and as they converted other people to believe in him, the converts told the stories to other converts, who told stories to other converts to other converts. And over time, these stories are being spread far and wide among people who hadn't seen any of these things happen. Over decades, great numbers of stories about the resurrected Jesus were written down. It was only into the third and fourth century that the church narrowed down the wealth of dozens and dozens and dozens of sacred texts to what was called a canon of texts. Canon is a Greek word for list. What books would be on the list? The early church fathers had four different criteria that they used in order to decide uh, which book should be in and which should be out. The, the first criterion is a book had to be ancient. It had to go back to the days of Jesus and his apostles. Secondly, the book had to be written by an apostle or by a companion of the apostles. They also had to be widely used. They, they couldn't be local favorites. They had to be used throughout the whole of Christendom uh, is the third criterion. And the fourth criterion is they couldn't promote some kind of heretical or false teaching. They had to toe the line theologically. This gospel doesn't emphasize the importance of Jesus' death and resurrection for salvation. This gospel did not toe the line theologically, and for that reason, church fathers condemned it, and that's why it ended up becoming lost until it was discovered in 1945. When you read the Gospel of Thomas, there Jesus says the kingdom of God is not something coming at the end of time. It's something inside you, outside of you. It's something everywhere. There Jesus says the kingdom of God is not something coming at the end of time. It's something inside you, outside of you. It's something everywhere. It's, it's living in the presence of God. This wasn't it the original meeting where Jesus appeared. He's probably afraid or discouraged or just didn't want to be there because somebody might show up to arrest them all. Thomas came back. His colleagues told him that, that the Lord is risen. We've seen him, he was here. And he says, I refuse to believe that. That's absolutely ridiculous. He's, he, he's dead, deal with it. Thomas said what a lot of us would have said. I don't believe it, prove it. I gotta see it for myself. Now that you're here, I need, I need more evidence. Thomas has an attitude different than everybody else. Thomas wants evidence. Thomas wants to know that this is the man who carries the history in his flesh. Thomas is a scientist. He's doing exactly what a scientist would do. Show me. Demonstrate. any longer. Thomas moves from being a doubter to being an evangelist, and that happened with all of the disciples. Jesus says at that point, and it, when, when it's clear that Thomas does believe, blessed are those who have believed without seeing. The appearances after the resurrection and before the ascension are anecdotes that show us how this movement moved from being a group of intimidated, terrified, defeated failures to becoming a group of people who were about to ignite the empire. The miraculous experience of the 40 days will change these anxious disciples into fearless apostles. The key to their transformation will be an event so spectacular and mysterious 
that it has defied description for 2,000 years, the ascension of Jesus Christ. And scholars debate, what is the nature of these sayings? What kind of teachings do they represent? Could they be the way Jesus actually said these sayings? Could they be the more original form of those sayings? And these sayings that are not found in the New Testament, is it possible that Jesus really said these things? Is this an additional source for us for understanding Jesus' teachings? This gospel doesn't emphasize the importance of Jesus' death and resurrection for salvation. This gospel did not toe the line theologically, and for that reason, church fathers condemned it, and that's why it ended up becoming lost until it was discovered in 1945. The opening lines of that gospel have intrigued scholars for half a century. These are the secret words of the living Jesus, and Judas Didymus Thomas wrote them down. Whoever understands the secret meaning of these words will not taste death. Whoever understands the secret meaning of these words will not taste death. And there's a meaning inside this gospel that this gospel is a way of becoming the twin of Jesus. That he's in fact saying, understand this stuff and you're me. You have a spark of the divine within you. You have to know yourself to come into the kingdom. You are the sons of the living Father. There Jesus says the kingdom of God is not something coming at the end of time. It's something inside you, outside of you. It's something everywhere. It's, it's living in the presence of God. It's, it's living in the presence of God. It's, it's living in the presence of God.